Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edisat Live Lectures. Dear friends, today in international relations, we will talk about uh, Dolcom standoff, Doklam standoff, sorry, and India-China relations. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Dr. Rajan Kumar. Dr. Kumar is Associate Professor in School for International Studies, JNU. Without further ado, I would like to welcome sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome, Thank you, Amrit Palko. Thank you so much. And friends, uh, we'll be talking about a very interesting topic today, uh, which is now kind of you know being debated in the Indian TV media studios, newspapers. Almost every day, you have a few articles in the newspapers. So we'll be talking about a very important issue: the Doklam uh, kind of standoff, which is there between India and China, and the, and how is it impacting the relationship between India and China? So Doklam standoff and India-China relation. That's the topic of today's uh, lecture. And uh, in that, I'll start, I'll give you the background of uh, Doklam standoff. So what is the, this issue all about? Uh, uh, followed by uh, what is the historical background? Uh, finally, I'll conclude uh, by, by some kind of assessing the possibility of uh, the conflict which might emerge between India and China. Because many of the peoples are arguing that you know, this Doklam conflict may escalate to a full-scale war between India and China. So that comes later. I'll, I'll, I'll try to assess the possibility of that kind of situation emerging between India and China. But before that, uh, it's very important that we understand uh, what is uh, the issue, the Doklam issue. Uh, Doklam is a plateau uh, on, uh, on China and Bhutan border. Uh, please remember that that plateau is not, uh, 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 not uh, on the borders of India and China. It's actually a plateau on China and Bhutan border and I'll show you in the map also. The land in question, uh, it kind of spreads around 269 square kilometers on that plateau. And the standoff began in June uh, 2017, last month, when China started constructing a road in uh, Doklam. Uh, the proposed road that China is planning to construct, and as you know that China is uh, uh, constructing uh, roads on the, all the parts of the borders uh, between India and China. But this is very important because uh, it borders the, uh, the what is known in, uh, in the what, what is known as chicken neck uh, strip, a, st a small strip of land between uh, that connects mainstream of India with the northeastern part of India. So f that region becomes very very strategically important uh, for India, and uh, the proposed road would run from uh, Dokola town uh, to Bhutanese army camp at uh, Jomperli. Uh, legally, the dispute is between Bhutan and China. Uh, where both the parties uh, claim their sovereignty because you know the borders are not demarcated between Bhutan, Bhutan and uh, China and both the parties claim sovereignty in that particular area and there was also an agreement uh, you know in the in the in the 1990s the agreement between uh, Bhutan and uh, China that without uh, previous confidence without taking the uh, the parties into confidence uh, the status quo would be maintained which means that the, uh, none of the parties will try to uh, either alter the border or try to construct on the borders. So that was the agreement uh, between Bhutan and uh, China uh, in the late 1980s and 1990s. That was the kind of, you know, that was the situation prevailing uh, between the two states. And Bhutan, as you know, you know, is a very small state and compared to China, it's uh, not even, you know, it's, it cannot be compared to China, which is a huge state. Uh, what happened that when the road was being constructed, uh, some uh, the, uh, the Bhutanese protested, the Bhutanese army uh, 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 protested and it sent a message to India uh, for help. And the Bhutanese ambassador, as I'll show you in the slide, uh, Bhutanese ambassador also uh, asked for explicit help from India. So uh, Indian army, uh, in, as a consequence, as you know that uh, uh, India and Bhutan have a very uh, good relationship uh, right since the time of independence. And uh, uh, the, to the extent that you know, diplomacy uh, is also you know, uh, in kind of uh, supported and managed by India, the Bhutanese diplomacy in number of countries. Uh, so uh, the the Chi Indian Indian Army went for the help, and Indian Army stopped the construction of road by the Chinese Army. So that is how that is where the problem started, and it started just the last month, one month. And but one month, more than one month is gone now, and there is no immediate solution of this crisis. 
and uh, both the armies are uh, eyeball to eyeball that's the kind of language which is being used which means in, uh, around you know uh, army uh, indian army and uh, chinese army uh, both are facing each other and uh, doklam plateau as i told you is not technically the part of indian territory but india is sensitive as it gives china access to the chicken neck a narrow strip of land which connects uh, india to the northeastern states if you see the map it uh, it, it 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 will uh, tell you clearly that how this strip of land is very very important uh, in terms of security for india and uh, bhutan has no diplomatic ties with china and it deals through uh, india's ministry of external affairs so even in uh, beijing the there's no bhutanese embassy so uh, the uh, what what normally happens that you know that in the indian embassy there'll be one of the staffs from uh bhutan or he'll deal with the uh, that issue so normally you know uh, the, the even the diplomacy is done through the uh, through the indian ministry of external affairs uh, the, here i would like you to uh, see the map uh, uh, this gives you a broader idea of uh, this uh, doklam plateau uh, what, what you can see here is that you know that bhutan uh, and the small uh, small black uh, black dot that you see that's the doklam plateau that i'm talking about just below that is the narrow strip of land uh, which basically connects india and uh, and the north uh, mainstream india with the northeastern part of india and you see that that's very narrow so that becomes strategically very very important for, uh, for india and uh, the china is planning a bigger game there what china is planning is that you know china would like to get into bhutan uh, as it did in nepal and china through bhutan would also like to enter uh, you know bangladesh uh, so that's the Uh, you know the strategic uh, reason why china is interested in constructing the road of course it gives chinese army kind of leverage over the indian army if the roads are constructed but it also serves uh, economic motives so that you know uh, china can get access to bhutan and also after bhutan china can get access to uh, to uh, to to bangladesh so uh, the second map here if you can see uh, the the map here and this uh, map is got see uh, indian defense review i have not made this map i have borrowed from them so here you can see very clearly that how chumbi valley the that that valley is very very important and that, that valley kind of a, a dagger comes down to the uh, to the to the indian uh, part and here on the right hand side you see the donglang region and that's the doklam region and here is the siliguri corridor that I, that i was talking about that corridor which connects india with the northeastern parts of india so this tri junction uh, between sikkim china bhutan tri junction so that's point as you can uh, which has been pointed out so that's the point where you know uh, where uh, this tri junction uh, meets where the border of bhutan india and china meets and that that area is very very important because you know it's a very small strip of land as you can see below is bangladesh and uh, on the top is china so that is a strip of land becomes very very strategically important for india uh here uh, what has happened uh, in the last uh, few weeks that you know the rhetorics the the kind of you know the the psychological warfare which is being which is uh, you know taking place between india and china so the, if, you, if you see the language of china the chinese officials so the language on the, at the first glance it might appear very very threatening uh, for instance you know uh, the chinese defense ministry spokesperson uh, here wu qian uh, he said that india should abandon the impractical illusions Uh, it warned india that it would step up troops on borders if india did not withdraw and to the extent it also said that uh, I- I- india would be you know uh, india would be defeated the second time if india does not learn the lessons from uh, from the previous past uh, which basically it meant that you know india should unilaterally withdraw uh, the further statement came uh, from the chinese uh, side that it is easier to shake a mountain than the pla pla the people's liberation army that's the chinese army so it said uh, and it, it sometimes is very funny the kind of statements which are coming from the chinese side is very funny like you know it's easier to shake the mountain uh, than the pla which thinks you know that pla is is uh, very very strong and uh, you can shake the mountain but not the pla the reality is that you know in the last 30 years or so china has not fought a single war and uh, well there it has not fought a, any real war with the with a very important country so you know it's also you know this kind of uh, because uh, the domestic politics or these statements are not necessarily meant to send the message across it also it is also meant to appease the uh, the domestic population so that you know people think that china is very very powerful and there's no way the other countries can uh, can counter china the reality is that you know uh, 
uh, uh, the China has not fought a war and, uh, and uh, there is some kind of parity between India and China. Although China is economically, econ economically China is very powerful and I will show you the exact figure. Uh, militarily also, uh, it seems on the face of it that uh, China has more military weapons than India. But in the war what you need uh, is not just the number, what matters is not the number. Uh, if numbers were important then Vietnam would never have defeated China. Or, um, uh, in, or Vietnam, for instance, would have never defeated the uh, United States. So uh, you should not go by the numbers. What, is, what matters is the resolve of the country, what matters is the, the kind of uh, uh, sophisticated technology that you have, and what matters in today's context is the kind of information um, that you have. It also matters that how much uh, a country can mobilize the population. And it seems that you know, uh, India as a nation, is, India is a very nationalistic state and India is a very proud nation. And uh, uh, you know uh, the kind of uh, the, the country like India, uh, I think no country in the world, even not even the United States, uh, uh, can defeat India as far as uh, the military defeat is concerned. It's, it's nearly impossible. So and anyway, I'll come to that uh, in in a moment. But for the time being, you know, I'll uh, uh, I'll remain focused to the statements which have been issued issued by the Chinese side. Uh, Again, uh, uh, this uh, China has also carried it seems some uh, brigade level of uh, exercises, military exercises. But these kind of ex exercises uh, in the Tibet region are quite usual. And uh, uh, Global Times, which is a hardline party-run tabloid, uh, Global Times is the, uh, the tabloid of China. This kind of party-run, so it has issued uh, some of the very very funny statements. It has clearly said that you know that China can raise the issue of Sikkim and Kashmir if the standoff continues. Uh, here uh, the, the, the issue of Sikkim is important because in 2003 and later 2005, uh, Sik uh, China identified uh, Sikkim as a part of India. So now the problem is that China, what China or the Chinese spokesperson or the writers of the Global Times, what they don't realize that if they can raise the issue of Sikkim, uh, probably what is stopping India from raising the issue of Tibet again? Or uh, what is stopping India from raising the issue of uh, uh, say uh, Taiwan or the Hong Kong or uh, other uh, Xinjiang, which is the northwestern province of China. So, uh, you know, uh, there are a number of issues that these, uh, uh, you know, that uh, why these governments uh, should not try to ratchet up the kind of rhetorics what what they are playing. And uh, what they need to do is to calm down and think very rationally that what uh, what are they going to uh, the gain out of you know this conflict? What are the kind of you know political or the or in terms of strategic gain that these countries are going to gain uh, in case war happens between the two countries? So instead of you know uh, talking rationally or instead of thinking the implications of war rationally, what what these uh, uh, statements are you know these statements are creating unnecessary hostile uh, situation between India and China and both the states both the states need to be very very careful when uh, they give the statements because you know it's, it's good that you know if you, you hear from the, your leaders or the military leaders or the political leaders that uh, and all the time you know the, the, the military leaders or the political leaders the, the statements are very glorifying about the country but reality is very very different when it comes to the actual situation on the ground. So uh, 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 the Chinese, uh, the Global Times, uh, uh, it said uh, an, another statement which is again uh, uh, again very kind of you know, uh, it made a statement very recently that uh, that Hindu nationalist government is pushing India to war. Uh, this is to divert the attention from uh, from uh, other issues that India is facing. Similarly, it also said the Global Times which has become the kind of you know, mouthpiece of the Chinese party. Uh, uh, and uh, is issuing a lot of statements. Uh, China can rethink its position on Sikkim and Bhutan. Uh, Sikkim was recognized, as you know, as a part of uh, part, part of India by China in 2003. So there is no point of, of you know Sikkim, the issue of Sikkim being raised by China, and it's not going to help either China or India. So India, and it has clearly said, the Global Times also said, and also the party spokesperson uh, or the defense minister spokesperson, they have said that India should unilaterally. Uh, withdraw from uh, from uh, Doklam uh, before the dialogue on the uh, Doklam before the dialogue on Doklam continues. So that is the kind of Chinese position which have been taken, which is very hardline and very aggressive position. And uh, China as a country which is growing, which is a very good thing that China is growing and, is, uh, and it has raised uplifted a lot of uh, uh, poor poor uh, people who are there in China. But you know the uh, through war uh, China is going to gain nothing. Or uh, you know, it's going to lose. Uh, I mean, it, it, it is going to suffer military losses. It's going to suffer uh, economic losses, and it's very likely that you know 
um, that China will realize much later that war does not serve any purpose or aggressive positioning against a, a small country like Bhutan is not um, uh, is not creating a very good image of China in the international politics uh, uh, because you know China's image is already not very positive if you see the western countries uh, uh, if you ever happen to listen to the uh, Fox, watch the Fox, Fox, Fox News or number of CNN or number of other channels in the west even the BBC or even channels in Africa so the image of China is not very positive and China uh, through multilateral organizations like BRICS, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and also through WTO etc. China was trying to reconstruct an, uh, the image of a, uh, the country which is rising peacefully. But you know if, uh, if China uh, is trying to kind of bully a small nation uh, like Bhutan, so uh, the kind of soft power that China is willing to play, the kind of you know diplomacy that it wants to play in the international politics, that is not going to happen. And China must realize that you know it has to be careful when it uh, you know uh, it sends its military on the borders. Uh, with borders, I'm not sure how much of economic or military gain uh, is, it will have, but definitely it's losing its image as a country which is uh, rising peacefully. It was also said by a lot of scholars, if you see the, read, the, uh, read the literature, that China has solved border issue with most of the countries. Um, I think you know uh, it did uh, you know uh, solve some of the issues with uh, with uh, Russia and some of the other countries in Southeast Asia. But now what is happening that uh, China is having border issues with number of countries in the world uh, and it has not solved uh, the border issue uh, with india it has not uh, despite you know more than 23 24 the dialogues which have taken place there is no progress on the issue of border between india and china as a consequence india also decided not to participate in the you know one belt one road uh, the conference where india was also invited uh, uh, then uh, in the china has border issues with taiwan um, you know the issue with uh, Hong Kong is a different in nature. Uh, it also has and in South China Sea. If you see, you know it has a conflict with uh, number of countries there: uh, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, Brunei. Number of countries which actually claim uh, their uh, you know the the sovereignty in the deep sea there. Uh, so uh, South China Sea it has problem with number of countries. Uh, in this with uh, with India and the border issues are not uh, resolved and with also Russia although Russia is very close to uh, China at the moment and uh, but Russia is also equally close to India and in terms of you know the military supplies etc Russia supplies military products to both India and China uh, so uh, Russia is close to both the countries but uh, coming to the border issues uh, so uh, there are certain although the border issues uh, uh, China has solved the border issues with many of the Central Asian states and Central Asian states the smaller states they do not have any choice because you know they have to uh, they have to listen to what the Ch what China says because China is a huge uh, economic giant and China is investing a lot in uh, Central Asian states so these smaller states uh, do not have uh, much of choice and uh, I must admit that you know the Central Asian states managed to uh, solve the border issues with China amicably and Russia, Russia and China both played very important role in that. But the border issues of China with other countries which have, uh, which have not, uh, which have not uh, kind of you know uh, followed the dictates from China, so in those countries border issue, issues remain. There is Vietnam in South China Sea or India or in, in Japan also it has a, a different kind of conflict that you know. So, uh, it, we, we need to understand that no, that the notion of China's peaceful rise, the quote unquote peaceful rise of China is a misnomer, it's a myth. China is not rising peacefully and is China is having a very aggressive posturing when it comes to uh, dealing with the border issues. Uh, also in Africa, if you go to Africa, the kind of, you know, uh, the resistance, the kind of uh, the kind of image that uh, China has, that people have started talking that what China is doing in uh, South Africa, in, in, in not uh, South Africa but in other African states, is nothing but a different kind of uh, imperialism. So China has to be very careful if actually it is trying to build its image. Uh, so that is as far as the soft power is concerned. But if hard power, if I'll, I'll show you the figures that how India compares with uh, with China. So uh, China has to be very careful because you know India is not Bhutan, India is also not Vietnam. So India and uh, of course uh, what in the kind of militarism, the kind of you know the weapons that India has developed and then kind of resolve that India has today, uh, uh, it would be very very difficult uh, with China 
if China adopts very aggressive uh, postures. Uh, but India also, uh, you know, needs to negotiate with the Chinese diplomacy, and India has to be careful that you know, and when it, it should not react unnecessarily to the uh, some of the some of the you know rhetorics or some of the some of the very hard statements which are being issued either by the Global Times, the the media of the Chinese Party, or by or by the spokesperson. So India has to uh, develop a very calibrated approach uh, towards China. And it's also because you know the kind of economic partnership that we have with China. So uh, we have huge trade deficit, and in case there is some kind of conflict uh, between these two countries, so the entire economic relationship would be destroyed, which will not be in, in the interest of China. Of course, India will also lose uh, out of it, but China is also going to because of the trade deficit. China is the beneficiary of the trade that we have between India and China. So, uh, what is Indian position? What is the Indian official statement that has come in the last uh, uh, last few weeks? So, India insists that according to 2012 agreement, the status of Doklam would be decided only through joint cons consultations involving all the parties. Uh, in all the parties, so here would mean uh, India, Bhutan, and China, all three parties, because you know they are in, uh, all three parties are involved. So, that was the kind of you know the negotiation which was taking place between. Uh, India and China on the border issues. So this was the kind of you know a decision. This was the kind of you know uh, the the decisions which were taken by the two countries. But Bhutan's ambassador to India, uh, Wetsop Namgyal, so uh, he uh, issued a statement that China is constructing a road which is violating the agreement between uh, Bhutan and China. So uh, India's external affairs minister, uh, Mrs. Susma Swaraj, uh, she. Uh, issued a statement in the parliament that uh, and uh, it is a very positive sign that you know India is trying to explore the 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 route of negotiation rather than uh, kind of you know uh, the the kind of uh, increasing the sound bites uh, against china so uh, she clearly said that we are looking for a very peaceful resolution of the standoff or of the conflict and there cannot be any unilateral withdrawal of force forces uh, uh, either it has to be you know uh, both the countries or both the parties that they decide a mutual time period where they decide to withdraw but uh, india said very clearly that you know uh, india is not going to withdraw uh, the forces from doklam unilaterally so that is a statement which was given by susma swaraj in the parliament and that gives a very clear message uh, that you know and now since he has given the statement in the parliament and india is a democracy so for india it would be very difficult to withdraw from that statement so china has to understand all of that so you know the 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 kind of uh, just in just giving the statements does not solve the problem you need to sit down and negotiate so unless until you talk uh, with the other parties uh, there's uh, the, the solution is not going to come uh, both the countries according to the indian position both the countries should withdraw simultaneously uh, Arun Jaitley, the Defence Minister of India, uh, he made a statement that this is not India of 1962, uh, which means that you know India has acquire, acquired military power, India has economically now in one of the fastest growing countries uh, uh, in in the in the world, and it has uh, a huge parity uh, in terms of you know uh, military, economy, etc. So uh, it's very clear that you know uh, the uh, the maximum that we have will a uh, kind of deadlock between India and China. So, uh, Army Chief Bipin Rawat, the Indian Army Chief Bipin Rawat, he uh, issued a statement that India is prepared for two and a half front war. What does this mean? Uh, two and a half front war means that uh, India has the capacity to, uh, you know, to take on uh, China, Pakistan, uh, and the, some kind of, you know, the the insurgency that we have in conflict or in the northeast. So, India has the Indian Army has the capacity to fight two and a half wars uh, simultaneously. So uh, that is a very strong statement which has come from the Indian uh, general, the military general Bipin Rawat, and the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, he also met the G20 leader. Uh, he also met the G20 leaders, but he, on in the sidelines he also met uh, the the Chinese Premier uh, Xi Jinping. But you know there is no. It seems that you know officially at least you know there is no dialogue between uh, these two leaders as far as the you know the kind of statements which have been issued by the ministry that there has not been official dialogue on, on this issue between the two leaders but what is likely to happen that uh, the national security advisor the ajit doval uh, he is likely to visit uh, beijing uh, 
he in in a day or two in fact you know the 26 27th 28 that's the date of meeting so he is uh, going to uh, beijing he has not cancelled his visit and being a national security advisor and this meeting is also about the security so in that it's very likely that he will discuss the issue of uh, this uh, the 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 doklam standoff with the chinese counterpart uh, yang jiechi at beijing so uh, although i do not see that you know uh, uh, um, uh, that any immediate solution uh, would be coming out of it but these kind of meetings are very very important for confidence building so uh, because you know uh, in the absence of information in the absence of meetings uh, the the uh, unless until you communicate with other parties so there are a lot of misconceptions which are created by media because you know indian media is not controlled indian media is very independent uh, some of them you know and there is competitive nationalism being played out in the indian media and some kind of jingoism also you see in the indian media so you know uh, uh, but you know these diplomacy they are very peaceful and these diplomacy can find a common ground for resolving this conflict uh, otherwise you know the kind of information which is being fed by media uh, to the people in respective countries so that can be very counterproductive uh, uh, and that can lead to uh, mobilizing the people that can lead to pressurizing the government to take very hard steps so this diplomacy is important diplomatic diplomatic channels are important both the countries uh, in uh, so try to you know negotiate this issue uh, doklam con doklam issue in the uh, through the through the diplomatic engagements uh, what are the international responses uh, us uh, the so called you know india has tried to develop very close relationship with the us but us has clearly said that you know both the parties uh, so try to amicably resolve the issue uh russia which is very close friend of india but it has, it is equally close to china so russia has not issued any official statement but i believe that if it has to issue the statement it will say the same thing that you know the india and china so should uh, resolve the is the issue bilaterally uh, pakistan uh, of course you know the criticism is expected from pakistan so pakistan says that india is uh, adopting very aggressive posturing on the borders so you know which is nothing new and this was expected from pakistan uh, as far as the media is concerned for instance you know the international media bbc uh, it says that you know uh, there is an eyeball to eyeball standoff between india and china the guardian the again the british newspaper it said that uh, an armed conflict between the two asian powers are unlikely so uh, if, if briefly you know i'll give you an idea of you know Uh, comparing the and uh, the indian and the mil- and and the chinese military power so defense budget of china is around 150 billion uh, india's defense budget is uh, about 50 billion dollars there is a, if i talk about the active army personnel so india has 1.3 million china has 2.3 million the reserve army india has 2.1 china has 2. Uh, 3 fighter aircrafts uh, india has uh, 676 china 1271 Uh, attack aircraft uh, 809 for india 1385 for china attack helicopters india has 27 china has 206 tanks india has 4426 and china 6457 so you know nuclear warhead warheads india has 110 and china has uh, 260 and the cruise missiles uh, india has 400 and china has uh, china has 3600 so you know on the face of it it appears that you know uh, china is having a military Uh, superiority of over India, but you know it's very difficult you know, because you know India has a huge parity and the kind of military power that it has, uh, no country in the world is in position to attack China, attack India, and I don't think uh, China would be stupid to kind of you know go into a, uh, any kind of big uh, conflict with India. Uh, thank you so much. I come to the conclusion of this lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Hello friends, in this part of the lecture, I will talk about you know, the, the, the kind of the India-China relationship, especially after the Doklam conflict, Doklam standoff. So, you know, it's being speculated all over the media places, all over, you know, if you see, in the, if you read in the newspapers or the media, if you watch the TV channels, news, news channels, so you will see that, you know, some kind of a condition or, or the impression is being given that uh, the war is likely between uh, India and China. So, uh, I'll talk about that. What is the possibility of war uh, between India and China? But I'll also talk about the kind of background, the history. So, why you know India and China have reached a point where it's very difficult to you know uh, difficult for both the countries to negotiate. So, what is the history? Uh, how uh, India and China have done in the last uh, uh, 60 years or so? Uh, so, we'll talk about that, and we'll also give you uh, some you know kind of uh, the conflict is one part, but towards the end, I'll also talk about the kind of economic cooperation uh, which is taking place even now between India and China. So, how these issues kind of you know uh, lead to India-China relationship? I'll start with the the very important question of what is the possibility of war between India and China? Uh, if you are not very careful about reading the newspapers, uh, um, uh, either uh, the Chinese people I'm I'm, I'm talking either for the Chinese. Uh, uh, ordinary people or for the or the Indian ordinary people, uh, if you just uh, watch the, uh, the news channels or if you just follow the statements or some of the, uh, some of the spokesperson, especially from the defense person, it, will, it might appear that the war is very likely between India and China. But I, uh, I sincerely believe that you know, it is very unlikely that uh, a real war between India and China will take place. Uh, and I will give you a very strong reason why that is very unlikely. Uh, and I'm saying that you know the war is unlikely not because uh, you know, uh, but because both the countries have nuclear power, or that there is a theory of nuclear deterrence that you know when you have two nuclear countries, full-scale war is not possible. Uh, that's not the reason why India and China will not go to war. The major reason uh, why India and China will not go to war is uh, the, the 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 inability to win the war. Uh, China knows very uh, very clearly that you know uh, uh, that China cannot war, win a war against India. India also knows very clearly that China is very powerful and it's not e easy to defeat China uh, China in the war. So the inability to defeat the war will hold these countries from uh, from going for a full scale war. Uh, despite the gap in uh, economy and the, the gap in military, and uh, you know uh, as I told you that you know there is um, economically China is. Uh, China Chinese economy is much bigger compared to the Indian economy. It's almost like four times, four four point five times bigger than the Indian economy. Uh, militarily also, if you see just the numbers, the how many aircrafts China has, how many missiles China has, or if you see just how many tanks, so that it will appear that you know uh, China has some kind of numerical numerical superiority over over the Indian military. But remember that in the war, what matters is not not the number. In in war, what matters that you know is the result. If the two neighbors, if there are two neighbors and one has two rifle and the other neighbor has just one rifle, does not mean that the other neighbor has the capacity to attack the the, the, the neighbor who has just one rifle. So that in the, in the real war situation, that doesn't happen. You know, the numbers uh, is good to show to your people or to the international community that you have that number of weapons. But what matters in the war is the resolve. And I can very clearly tell you that in the war kind of situation, India has uh, advantage in certain areas, China has advantage in certain areas. So both the countries have advantages uh, in certain areas and uh, most of the Chinese trade uh, is taking place through, uh, through the Indian Ocean. So, uh, so do you think that China will risk that kind of uh, situation where you know, the 60% or, or nearly 50% of the trade, especially the, the import of oil and also export is taking place through the Indian Ocean? So, uh, if the war, uh, the real war, and uh, the full-scale war kind of situation is created, so that export and import will uh, come under siege. So, and it takes uh, uh, how many hours it takes from Indian military to attack the uh, the Chinese ship passing through the Indian Ocean. So, uh, the countries, you know, the countries have to be very careful. The countries cannot uh, just escalate the situation. Although statements are fine, we know that we need to the politicians and the and the strategic expert. They need to appease appease the people. They need to. They need to uh, issue very strong statements, but when it comes to the real situation, so both the countries are not in position to fight war. Despite the gap, as I told you, in, in the military or economy, India and China, in terms of population, technology, etc., they have a huge parity. You know, it's comparable. All the numbers might vary here and there, but there is a huge parity. India thinks that it, India also thinks that it lost the war in 1962, not because Indian military was weak. But because of the political stupidity of the leadership and inability to predict the Chinese behavior, uh, and, and 
and, and also know that you no know, democracy always protects the army and it blames the politician unlike china where you know uh, there is total absence of democracy so even what is real and what is fake the the distinction is blurred you don't really know that what is real and what is fake uh, the actual numbers uh, is uh, uh, when it comes to china is uh, is is questionable also because of the lack of transparency and uh, the lack of dissent that you have compared to that the indian information can be much more uh, much more you know uh, open and uh, to an extent reliable also because you know you you have the parliament where the opposition parties uh, have the right to question the, the the ruling party and the figures can be you know uh, figures can be uh, dis- debated the quality can be debated but you know by and large you have some kind of transparency because of the democracy that we have in india so chinese economic loss would be a major deterrent factor as i told you that the trade between india and china so and there is a deficit trade deficit of uh nearly 51 billion dollars uh, so china is benefiting hugely out of uh, out of the trade which takes place between india and china so in that kind of situation you know i don't think that you know china will take a very irrational decision uh, to uh, to go in a in a full scale war with india uh china will also be branded please remember that china in the recent years china is very careful about branding its image in the international community and uh, at the moment international community uh, um, the opinion of the international co- community is much more favorable to india than it is to china uh, partly the reason is uh, there are two reasons why uh, indian uh, the international opinion is favorable to india than to china because india is a in, is a democracy um, no, we have a very noisy democracy and there are there are number of loopholes that we have the number of shortcomings that indian democracy has but the fact is that you know we have Uh, that uh, despite having a huge uh, and large long period of colonial rule we managed to sustain the democracy in india so that is uh, respected by uh, by the international community so most of the in fact if you go to africa if you go to number of countries in east europe and number and even in the in the western countries they they want to they want to see how india is a such a diverse country can adopt the democracy and and sustain the democracy so that model of democracy is very very important and that creates a very favorable opinion uh, of uh, of india in the international community and uh, the second is of course the economy uh, china is growing but at the same time you know the indian economy is growing in fact it is said very clearly by the international economic experts that uh, china, there is a very small window of opportunity for both india and china Uh, china chinese economy has slowed down and that is not a very good sign uh, for uh, for china because you know the export because of the global slowdown of the economy the chinese export has also slowed down and china is export oriented economy and if the economic slowdown continues then china it will be very difficult for china uh, to 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 kind of you know to project its image as the as a very growing country and china has a lot of economic issues Uh, uh, it has huge disparity it also has a uh, lot of poverty although it has uplifted which is praiseworthy that it has uplifted uh, you know a lot of uh, poor people uh, from the poverty but even now uh, the kind of rural urban divide that it has uh, the labor unrest that you see in many of the country, many of the regions of china so and of course the issue of xinjiang then tibet taiwan hong kong so china and on the external borders uh, like the issue with japan south korea so china has a number of issues to settle so china is not in, in you know international opinion china will destroy its international opinion china will destroy its image as a country which has which is rising peacefully if it uh, it it goes into some kind of adventure with india uh, any kind of border conflict will completely destroy the image of china as a country which is which has resolved the border issues with a number of countries uh, chinese supply route as i told you would be completely Uh, geopardized if uh, there is some kind of real uh, conflict or real war uh, uh, between between india and china i'm i'm not denying that you know a small uh, skirmish skirmishes might not take place in fact it's very likely that you no know, if uh, the two countries do not deescalate the the situation or if they do not negotiate very uh, clearly or very uh, categorically on the issue of border so you know because after all human beings are very unpredictable after all you know the war happens just because of the mistakes silly mistakes of uh, a few leaders so uh, one has to be very careful and one has to and that's the reason one has to negotiate on a day to day basis with the with the hostile countries but you know uh, the full scale war between india and china 
uh, my, my, my strong answer would be unlikely, very, very unlikely. Uh, short term skirmishes is a real possibility. China will, uh, what is uh, going to happen, what is likely that you know the kind of policy that China is going to pursue or follow in the next uh, few years, that China will support uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, which will create uh, you know, a problem for India. Uh, China will also, you know, uh, China might support some of the kind of, you know, uh, uh, the kind of insurgency that we have either in either in Jammu and Kashmir or the northeastern states or even to an extent uh, the kind of Naxal problems that we have. So it's possible that China might, you know, uh, either fund or tacitly or indirectly support these proxy wars against India. But a real uh, war between India and China, uh, very unlikely and that will be very disastrous uh, for both India and China and also uh, for the international uh, community. But on a, on, there is a larger issue which I would like to bring your attention to. What is happening is that you know a theater of conflict, I am not saying war, I am using the term theater of conflict is, emer is emerging uh, between India and China, not just because of, the, because of the small border issue that we have, also because of the ideological differences uh, that India has uh, with China. Uh, China is a very strong authoritarian one party rule state. Uh, compare that with India, and India is a very uh, vibrant democracy. India is a democracy which has, you know, established separation of power. India has a number of political parties, and you see that how one party is blaming the other on a day-to-day -day basis. It might appear at the time being that you know politicians are not serious, but this kind of democracy is, 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 is a product of long struggle, and the, it shows the maturity of uh, Indian people and faith in. Uh, faith in the political system that we have evolved in the last 60 years and it's our duty, it's our duty to preserve that kind of diversity, preserve that kind of democracy. So what is happening that, you know, uh, th there's some kind of ideological theatre of conflict is emerging where, you know, India will, uh, India is a, a liberal democracy and uh, the China is a socialist authoritarianism. So uh, China uh, would like to promote its own ideology, um, uh, China would like to promote its own soft power, but India comes as a major block. Uh, in the South Asia, in, in also in the other Asian countries, the, the you know uh, no matter what they say, but they they, they know the fact that India is a democracy and that democ uh, democracy is respected, and the fact that China has been very repressive towards the the the, the moment of dissent or the uh, the kind of you know the protest movements which have taken place, so that does not augur well for China, and the biggest threat to China is uh, from in, in today's context and military context. Uh, the biggest threat to China is not the military conflict, military uh, from other country, either India or United States or Japan. That's not the uh, real threat to China. The real threat to China today is if democracy comes or some kind of democratic movement takes place in China. And as you know, China believes that you know the number of countries which are promoting democracy, and it also blames India that you know India is playing a role. Uh, in democracy and India is blamed because of Tibet, the issue of Tibet which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the India gave refuge to Dalai Lama uh, but um, the Tibetans have been uh, non-violent, Tibetans have been peaceful, uh, uh, the movement and there is no direct evidence also today that, you know, uh, China, is, uh, India is uh, promoting Tibetans against China. Although China will, will never believe that, it will be very difficult for you know, uh, for, for China to accept that. Uh, in fact, India recognized Tibet as part of China. India recognized long time back in 1954. India also recognized uh, Tibet as part of China in 19, uh, in, in 2000, uh, 2000 uh, I think, one, three, uh, when uh, uh, in this uh, Atal Bihari Bajpayee. Uh, so China, uh, Tibet, India has been very positive when it comes to, you know, uh, this. But that, the fact that India is uh, India has some kind of sympathy for Tibet uh, because you know it supports democracy everywhere or India is a democracy and it has to protect the values of democracy which means protecting the right to protest which means protecting the right to dissent so that does not augur well with China and China is very scared of uh, that kind of uh, democratic value. A one party rule which means that you know you will not allow the other parties to protest, you will not allow other parties to, uh, to argue against you, to critique against you. So that kind of system, so what is happening is that you know theater of conflict, ideological conflict is emerging uh, between India and China where the two countries, one is democracy, uh, liberal democracy, other is uh, socialist authoritarianism. And also uh, you know, recently what you see is that the majoritarian nationalism versus party authoritarianism. Uh, so that kind of ideological conflict is also contributing to uh, some of the rhetorics that you see uh, in the global times or in the media, also in, um, also in some of the Indian media houses. 
uh, in the media news channels so that is contributing to a kind of you know a conflict kind of situation so uh, i don't think that helps in resolving the issue because the uh, because the, the people who know about china they they're not allowed to speak they don't speak much and people who are you know uh, who who just read newspapers they become the experts in both the countries so that that is uh, one of the issues that you know we need to be careful when it comes to understanding uh, academically when we need to understand the, conf- the the issue between india and china now briefly if you allow me uh, you know uh, then i'll go into the brief background that what happened in 1962 and before that uh, so uh, chinese communist party as you know was established in 1949 by replacing the kuomintang uh, government um, that is the time when india became independent 1947 i am talking about and a new job, geopolitics is emerging uh, the, the cold war politics is emerging uh, pla entered tibet in 1951 and tibet was a buffer zone during the british period between uh, british india and china the friendship treaty of 1954 that was uh, that was signed where india relinquished the special rights in tibet and recognized tibet as a part of china panchshil agreement was signed as a guiding principle uh, for the bilateral and multilateral cooperation between the two countries and the respect for sovereignty non aggression non interference cooperation and peaceful co- coexistence so these were the kind of you know guiding principles for you know um, the, the for the relationship between the two countries but the war happened in 1962 and the entire panchshil principle was Uh, was you know abandoned by 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 both the countries uh but india also gives in the in the, in the historically you know uh, the fact that india india thinks that or indian people at least think that uh, why in that india has been betrayed by china because you know india supported uh, india supported the case of china in the in the afro asian conferences bandung conference uh, india also supported the case of china in the when it came to its membership Uh, in the united nations security council uh, so in the in the supported that but you know in the indian feel that no china india has been betrayed by china because the reciprocation which should have come from china that has not happened and china has kept raging the border issue uh, with india and has not seriously tried to resolve the issue between the two countries so the issue of tibet um, briefly into the background the when manchu emperor of qing dynasty collapsed in collapsed in 1911 and 12 the tibetans declared independence in 1913 in october 1913 sir henry mcmohan mcmohan negotiated a division of tibet between inner tibet and under chinese control and outer tibet under dalai lama so he also demarcated a line between tibet and northeastern india unfortunately that line is not accepted by china china thinks that you know that mcmahon line is an imperial line and china will not accept that line as the border in, in the eastern border between india and china uh, nehru in 1954 recognized tibet as part of china and atal bihari was made later he also retreated in 2003 uh, here if you if i can show you the map here so here is the map which uh, shows you you know the areas of conflict between the two countries here you can see on the on the western side on the western border uh, the area which has has been given by pakistan to china so that is uh, claimed by india and that's the area where china has constructed the road karakoram highway uh, which connects uh, the province of sinkiang to uh, pakistan till gwadar and the china pakistan economic corridor what you're talking about that passes through that and that's one of the reasons why india refused to join uh, india refused to join the one belt one road project and here below that uh, the aksai chin area that you can see in the map uh, here aksai chin that is claimed area which is controlled by china but which is claimed by india and it's a disputed area and uh, uh, it's a disputed um, part and india think india claims that you know that that was if in that in, during the earlier period aksai chin was a part of uh, jammu and kashmir jammu and kashmir uh, in in the earlier period but in jammu and kashmir became part of india but aksai chin after 1962 remained with china on the eastern side as you can see uh, on the western uh, the the border of himachal and uttar pradesh we also have issue the disputed borders uh, which is the western area but the major issue now is the eastern uh, area on the right hand side uh, you can see the mcmohan line uh, uh, which is the disputed border and arunachal pradesh uh, the entire arunachal pradesh is claimed uh, by china uh, because you know it uh, china claims that you know arunachal pradesh is part of uh, part of uh, tibet that province and you know uh, 
technically according to them uh, Arunachal Pradesh is a part of that uh, that uh, uh, Tibet so uh, uh, as you know that you know uh, Tibet uh, Arunachal Pradesh is an integral part of uh, India the uh, one of the ministers Rijiju is from Arunachal Pradesh in India and uh, the Arunachal Pradesh has been an issue of conflict uh, uh, but you know it's very unlikely that you know, it's very unlikely that you know uh, uh, very uh, that as some kind of easy resolution resolution on the issue of uh, Arunachal Pradesh is uh, unlikely to take place between the between the two countries. Uh, but here, that but the the latest conflict is in the Doklam. Doklam is the the the, the trijunction, uh, which is you know uh, the Bhutan, uh, China, and India border, uh, the just above the Siliguri corridor. So that's the area where. Doklam is located and you can see the map earlier map where Doklam is located and Tri Junction becomes very very important for India because of the strategic reasons and also because of that you know connects uh, mainstream India with uh, the northeastern part of India. So the western section you see that there is an area of about 33,000 kilometer square kilometer. So that is the area which is you know uh, disputed between the two countries and here in the eastern section there is almost 90,000 kilometers uh, which is uh, disputed uh, between the two countries. The middle area, where around, around 2,000 uh, 2, kilometer square kilometers, location between uh, this uh, in Himachal Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh, which is disputed between the two countries, and you can see that in the map, the red border that you can see on the on the north and the north western side, so that is the disputed area, and India China here again, uh, there is a map. Uh, this courtesy Heritage Organization, uh, Heritage dot org. So it also tells you, it gives you some of the details about the you know the kind of uh, the Ksai chain, a barren plateau that was part of a formal princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, has been administered by Chinese since 1962. Uh, Sino-Indian border conflict, uh, one of the main causes of that uh, war was India's discovery of a road China built through the region, which India considers its own territory. Eastern section China claims the portion of uh, in the state of Arunachal Pradesh as South Tibet and does not recognize the McMahon line uh, established in 1914 by British and Tibetan representatives, China withdrew its troops behind the McMahon line, uh, which is which it refers to as the line of actual control after the 1962 border, border war. <coughs> the Lhasa uprising 1959, um, and that I'm not going into the details, the history that uh, you know you can see in the previous lectures. But you know here Lhasa uprising in 1959, so that the Dalai Lama took refuge in India and which contributed to the, the war which took place between India and China in 1962. Uh, Chao Enlai visited uh, twice to India in 1957-1960 but that failed to resolve the issue and finally we had the war uh, between uh, India and China in 1962 and uh, um, the one of the major uh, the, the reasons for war India allowed Dalai Lama to take refuge in India so China thought that you know India is uh, promoting Tibetan uh, and then this Tibetan uprising, which was not the case, um, you know, the refuge because India has very close relationship with Buddhism, and you know, it's very difficult for India that you know, if a Buddhist leader comes from any other country, it would be very difficult for India to not give him the refuge, whether it comes from Tibet or any other country. So you know, because India has a very close religious civilizational links uh, due to Buddhism, so Buddhism is still a very uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an important religion in India, so it, it becomes very difficult for India not to give the refuse when a Buddhist monk who is non-violent, when he is asking for some refuse uh, in India. So border issue, China did not accept the McMahon line, so borders are dispute, um, were identified, um, borders were not demarcated and there was a lack of trust between Mao who was the leader of China and, 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 and Nehru. Um, Mao considered Nehru a bourgeois agent of the United States. Nehru never imagined that a socialist progressive force will attack India. So that overconfidence also contributed to uh, some kind of you know miscalculation that India had uh, in 1962. And the rivalry, uh, the rivalry for leadership, uh, that uh, also contributed in a way uh, because India was also trying to be the leader of the African and Asian countries, and so was China. So that also contributed to some kind of competition between India and China and China wanted to teach a lesson uh, and post 1962 you know uh, one good thing is that you know um, there has not been a, a real military conflict uh, between India and China and the borders have been by and large 
uh, silent. Uh, the bullets have not been fired in the last 30 years or so. Uh, Sino Indian, uh, but the impact of post 1962 was very, uh, you know, uh, devastating for the two countries. Uh, Sino Indian relation was frozen till 1988 when Rajiv Gandhi later decided to uh, the, discuss the issues with China. Uh, China also started supporting Pakistan and, and the, in the conflicts, you know, and that happened between India and Pakistan. China took the side of Pakistan many times and China su supported the military, hardware, nuclear program and also it has started supplying military weapons to China, missiles also to, China, to, to Pakistan. So that contributed to increased uh, conflict between uh, India and Pakistan and, uh, in a way to India and China also. So the arms race, uh, what is happening in the post-1962, that there is a huge arm ra arms race which is happening between India and China. Uh, if you see the, 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 the this region, so what is happening is that uh, uh, Pakistan is trying to catch up with, uh, with India and India is trying to catch up with uh, China and China is trying to catch up with the United States. So it is leading to you know a uh, huge arms race in the region and which does not go well for a poor country like India and China. You know, both the countries have a lot of issues with poverty and other issues. And it's very important that, you know, instead of talking about the war, they should talk about the poverty. They should talk about the developmental issues, how they can eradicate the poverty in the next 10 decades. Rather than that, you know, they are trying for a small border issue and that becomes a very nationalistic issue for both the countries. So uh, we had uh, some Durongchu con confrontation in 1986-87 but uh, and that again was resolved by 1995. So the key issues if you have to uh, discuss between India and China, one is Tibet, second is Arunachal and third is the border issue. So that is the major area of conflict between India and uh, China. China-Pakistan alliance that is a major irritant between India and China. Uh, Chinese statement, there is also theory, although this theory I do not completely subscribe to, but there is a theory of string of pearls theory and this has been given by the Pentagon. So you have to be very careful when you take those statements. So string of pearls theory which says that you know, China is trying to contain India uh, through Chittagong in Bangladesh, Haman Tota port in Sri Lanka, uh, Gwadar in Pakistan. But is, India is also trying to develop some of the ports, uh, for instance in Chabahar in Iran and India is also trying to connect um, uh, you know, with uh, uh, the north-south uh, transport corridor which will connect Mumbai to Chabahar. Bandar Abbas and then to to the other uh, to uh, Azerbaijan, Iran, Moscow, etc. So you know uh, those theories are there, and uh, Indian response has been very positive. India India is firm in, in its position that you know both the countries should negotiate, both the country, the military of both the countries should withdraw, and uh, and they have been cooperating multilaterally through number of countries. Whether you talk of recently, India became the member of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, the BRICS, both the countries are member. Also on the climate issues, both the countries are cooperating. So there are number of areas where these countries uh, uh, are cooperating and the relationship is very uh, cooperative if you talk about the trade, economy, climate change, etc. So you know, we, India and China as a, as a country which is growing, they should try to resolve the developmental issues rather than go for rhetorics and unnecessary kind of war. So uh, this is in the interest of both the countries. With this, I'll finish this lecture here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, dear friends, we hope that with today's lecture you were able to understand the complexities of India-China relations. On that note, we would like to thank Dr. Rajan Kumar for coming here and delivering this wonderful lecture. And thank you dear friends for watching our lecture. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.